Okay. So, we're going to begin, and let's turn in our Bibles to uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. Uh, funny story, and it's, it's not a funny story, it's a true story. I've had, I told you last week I couldn't think about what I wanted to preach. This Sunday was the opposite. I had two complete sermons completely done that I kept on going back and forth. I couldn't decide which one I was going to speak today. And up until last night, I'm in my office looking at two complete different sermons, and I could not decide. And I was like, well, I guess if I don't do it this week, I'll have to do it next week. So I'm going with this one. And um, let me know if this makes any sense to you, because this is the one we're going to go with. Hebrews 11:13. It says, These all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we just call out to you, Father. We call, we cry out to you, Father. Lord, hear our prayers. Calm our hearts. Give peace to our souls. And we know you will because you're a God of promises and you keep them. So, Father, today, let thy Holy Spirit consume us all with truth. Let it speak to each heart in the way it needs to be spoken to. We think of our neighbors who are listening around. Bless each one of our neighbors outside here, those who are listening online. Because these are eternal truths. They are not just for Christians. They are the truth for all of creation. May it pierce our hearts, and may you give the winds a mighty voice this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title of this message this morning is, And If I Weep, and If I Weep. And a little sub-note here, I'm going to teach you the key to keep pushing on when you don't feel like pushing on. Now, you guys never get into a place like that, right? Because you guys just peace. You keep pushing through. Nothing stops you. You are full of encouragement and inspiration. Or do you feel like many of us who are tired and say, Lord, I don't think I can do this tomorrow. Well, I'm going to give you some secrets. And as our brother John taught magnificently uh, in this morning's Bible study, uh, God, if, if you don't know him here, look up in the stars because he is screaming out this message. And the message is, if you weep, make sure you weep for the right thing. Now we're gonna talk obviously a little bit about weeping in case you guys don't know. I mean, is there, any, is there anybody here who's never cried? Because I'd like to meet you. Anybody never ever cried? Because if you said yes, you're a liar because I have pictures of you when you were getting born and you were crying, okay? Isn't that funny? The first thing we start off with life is crying. It should have been a sign. <laughs> It should have been a sign. Well, it's part of the human condition. Some of us, and you know, as a pastor, of, as a church, a small church, I mean, I've, I've seen you guys cry. I know what you go through. We've cried together. We've cried at funerals. We've, we've cried at joyous things. And remember, a little clue here, do we just cry over sad things? Have you ever cried over something that's ex that you is so wonderful that it makes you cry? Because that's important. That's going to be a key. But of uh, crying, we have cried over loss. We have cried over hurt. We have cried over anger. Things done to you that you feel which is so horrible. We've cried over our children. Over our families. Some of us are crying over our finances. We've cried over sickness. Wow, does God know that? We've cried over our pains. We've cried over our marriages and our relationships. We've cried over our very church. And lately, I don't know about you, I'm crying over my nation. But you know what? To weep is not a bad thing, people. Matter of fact, one of the wisest men to ever live, King Solomon, said, To everything there is a season in Ecclesiastes 3, 4, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. So weeping is a natural thing. It's as natural as breathing. And so many times in counseling, you know, if I counsel people who are going through loss, I always ask them, if, have you cried yet? If they say no, I said, you've got to cry. 
You've got to break down hysterical and cry. If you don't, I'm going to be strong for everyone. No, you won't heal unless you cry. It's part of the process. But there is one thing that we don't weep and cry for that we should. I'm going to teach you something new this morning that maybe you don't know. And like I said, when I speak of weeping, it doesn't mean weeping for a loss but also weeping for something you want so badly that you can't wait for, that it actually makes you weep. You know, our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ said something interesting in one of the Gospels. He says, where your heart is, is where your treasure is. And where your treasure is, is where your heart is. Meaning, you can tell what's important to a person by what they weep over. You know, God knows what's important to every one of you. And we better make sure what's important to us, the most important thing, is where it's supposed to be. We can tell what's important to us, a person by what they weep over if they lose it and what they weep over because they have gained it. A lot of talk about lotto today. And when people win these big prizes, what do they do? They cry in joy. I can't believe I won. All those game shows where they run up. Ah, everybody's crying. I know about you guys. I'm a big weeper. Little secret. Especially with movies. And I've decided I would never watch any more sad movies. Because uh, I watched this movie once. It was actually two movies that did this to me. My dog Skip. If you ever saw that movie. I had to actually get up and say, you know what? I have to go into the bedroom, lay on the bed, and hysterically break down. I said, I, this is destroying me. And it was that other movie with Richard Gere and, and um, Jason. Where was it? Hagi? Hachi? Oh, gosh. If you ever saw that based on a true story, what a dog. I can't. That movie really destroyed me. That movie was just added. I just like, this is crazy. Why am I doing this? It's a stupid movie. So we do weep, we do weep. But the one thing we don't weep for that we should is what God talks about. Now I'm gonna give you some clues this morning and uh, lead to the big reveal at the end of this study. And the reason I bring this to you because it's a key, and I know it sounds strange, while weeping over something is the key to successful living, to getting through things? Yes, it is. It is the key to dealing with the daily minutia, borrowing that from Seinfeld, the daily minutia that you all must face every day. Don't you feel it? Everywhere you go. I tell you, there is not a place I go. Last night I was at the racetrack. Every conversation you seem to have, what are people talking about? What is going on? This is crazy. I'm concerned about what's coming. I said, I know. The news, the world, the issues, the concerns, the insanity that's all around us. People, I'm telling you, that's why I really feel that you need to be led to be prepared. I think part of the job of a pastor is to prepare his sheep. I think what's coming this fall is going to be historic. Whatever way it goes, I don't know. But things are coming, people. Things beyond our wildish imaginations, whether going bad or good, only God knows. But it's big. And if you're not prepared for these things, if your goal is on the wrong thing, you will be crushed. But wouldn't you like to be able to be smiling no matter what happens tomorrow, no matter what happens in November, no matter what happens next year or whatever? And there's a way. There's a way. In case you didn't know, during the times of the early church, did you know when the early church began, do you know it was a horrible time for Christians? Horrible. The early church lived every single day under fear of death, persecution, and calamity. They knew that they can be persecuted and they can be killed. 
And yet the amazing thing is they still went along with their daily jobs. They went down to the river, they washed the clothes, families were born, people got married. They didn't like climb under a hole and stop living. They lived, they thrived, even in the face of things beyond our imaginations. And keep in mind, interestingly, the early church knew nothing of wealth, they knew nothing of success, and they knew nothing of easy living. They only knew hard times. And they had a word that they would greet each other with to encourage one another as they face uncertain times. They would remind each other with a word, with one word, about what really mattered, because you need to be reminded what really matters, people, because the problem is what we think really matters is not what really matters. They were reminded by a word that what they were fighting for was worth dying for. It was the encouraging word. And why this life's pains didn't really matter, because they knew how it would end, and it would end victorious, 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 no matter what. And so they were able to smile at the storm. Anyone know what that word they would greet each other was with? Maranatha. What does it mean? Maranatha is an old word. It means, yep, this is a mess. I'm in pain. Life is not doing so well. Trouble is all around me, but praise God. Jesus is coming back for us. But that's not the word, and that's not the total clue of what I'm talking about. It's true, but that's not where we're going here. I'm talking about a focal point. People, you need a focal point to keep you going. You need a place to put your eye, because where are we putting our eyes? People, wherever our eye is focused is whatever is going to control us. If you're focusing on the negative things, which there's no shortage of them, it's no shortage. You will, it's impossible to be positive if you focus on the negative. So if you're going to be going through the fires of life, you better make sure what's getting you through that tunnel. How are you making it through there? I remember years ago, my old job, I had to uh, go through training and I was in, instructed on, I was getting taught down in West Virginia how to teach people to uh, work in hazardous environments, hazmat training. And I was getting trained to be an instructor. And one of the things we had to do, it's a really scary thing, I hated it, is we had to go through these little tunnel tubes filled with smoke. And you had to go from point A to point B on your knees with all this encapsulating gear and tanks that you would drag behind you. And they told you, if you don't focus on one thing, you will panic and you will get yourself trapped. And what did you focus on? The person in front of you. You can't see anything, but we got a rope and I'm following you. People, that's what our life is like. And if you start looking and going, I'm trapped in this thing, you're going to panic and you're going to freak out. Hebrews 12.1. If you don't know this scripture, we're going to go through verses 1, 2, and 3. But verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with such a great cloud of witness, we are circled with people watching us. Let us lay aside every weight. All of you, you got weights on your back. God knows them. If, if we had spiritual eyeglasses, we would see us carrying dirt you know, sandbags with all names on them fear children sickness health money and we're labored down but god says let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily trip us up add to that the sin and what does he say here let us run with patience the race that is set before us and i this this is the scripture i have on the back of the race car out at the track but it says here, let us, if, if you didn't think God wasn't into racing, he is. He's a big racing fan. But he says, run the race. How? And notice it says, run with patience the race that is set before us. Means it has been pre-set up. It has been established. You can't get out of the race. 
you're in it, so you better keep on going to win it. You don't look, so well, I'm getting out of this race. I don't like this race. I'm going to choose another race. No, it's already been set. You're in it. Everybody at the racetrack, I don't think anybody goes out there and says, yeah, I hope I come in 10th tonight. No, no, they want to win. What, you know, I think about the people like at nights like last night and last week, it is so hot. And just think about these guys in these cars, no heaters. The engine is like right there. They're in fire suits, gloves, hats, a, you know, a hood. The heat is intense. And I'm like, these guys go out there and they do this in the burning, dripping sweat. And they, I tell you, but they put every bit of, of enthusiasm into their racing because they are set their eyes on what's the prize. Checkered flag, people. Checkered flag is what makes them do this insane sport. <laughs> they want to win. We have to ask ourselves, do you guys want to win or just get through? But how do we do it? What should we focus on? Should we focus on winning, as I just said? Should I focus on gaining a lot of things? Should I focus on happiness? I will focus on happiness. Yes, that'll be my goal. Don't know if that's a good idea. Maybe I should focus on money. That'll get me through. Or maybe I should focus on my health. Just stay healthy, stay healthy. That's all that matters. Well, that's not what the Bible says, because in verse 2, it says this. This is how we won the race that is set before us. Verse 2, looking unto the UN. Is that what it says? <laughs> looking unto the CDC. Is that what it says? Looking unto CNN. Is that what it says? No. What does it say? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. It's already finished, people. You got to understand you're in a race that it's not that hard when you know you're going to win. The author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame and his reward, set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself. People tell me, everybody's against me. I am losing all friends. Everybody hates me. Yeah. Tell Jesus about it, okay? Everybody betrayed him. Everybody hated him for the most part. And they ultimately killed him, told lies, said, I don't know who Jesus is. I, you know, never heard of the guy. Because if you don't, it says, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. But again, that's still not where we're headed to this morning. And this is what I mean, because let's be honest. You know how brutally honest I am with you guys. And my goal is to preach such honesty. I always say until there's no one left that my mother's sitting here listening to the study. Well, maybe my wife might hang around too. I don't know. She might quit on me sooner. I don't know. But we're going to, because guys, I feel I am so responsible to tell you what you need to hear. Because I want you guys to thrive because God wants you guys to thrive. So let's be honest. What you really want is what you really are. I want you to think upon that. What you really strive for is what you really are. Where you find your happiness is really where you want to be. Kind of philosophical thoughts there to ponder. Well, this is the answer that we must consider. And I'm going to take this, the title of this message, and if I weep, I'm going to take it from uh, the name, or from the chorus of a song by a, a Christian artist. Uh, I've shown a couple of clips at one of the Bible studies once. Uh, this guy, this, this Christian artist is a very eccentric, prolific, aesthetic of a person he's a very odd christian he passed away in a tragic tragic car accident as he predicted that he would die in the fiery car crash and he did the artist is rich mullins and he's the guy who wrote our god is an awesome god remember that song but he wrote many other songs i actually love rich mullins because i love he says uh, you know what i'm thinking 
He's not afraid to question God and to be angry. He said some, you know, odd things about God. And people would say, Rich, you can't say that. Now he's just speaking his heart. He's speaking his heart, and you should. But the name of the song is, And If I Stand. And here is the chorus. It's in two parts. The chorus goes, So if I stand, let me stand on the promise that you will pull me through. And if I can't, let me fall on the grace that first brought me to you. And if I sing, let me sing of the joy that has borne in me these songs. And here it is. And if I weep, let me weep as a man who is longing for his home. That's powerful. And we want to talk about what Rich was talking about. Because these are deep truths that you just can't say, well, that's nice, I'll consider that. No, you've got to know this. You've got to be focused on it. You won't get through that tunnel of smoke if your eye isn't on the right prize. Riches was. For he was a man who was weeping for his home. One of the truths, people, and you're not going to like the gym. Whenever you say this truth, it's like, oh, I knew he was going to say that. I don't like that. But it's the truth. The truth that we forget is that this earth is not your home. It's a little short little blurb in the span, as John taught this morning, of the eons of time that has gone. Your little life is so smart, small. And you think, I must do it all here. This is it. This is everything. This is the only thing that matters. Nothing else matters. That is the greatest lie of the enemy. In Hebrews eleven thirteen, 13, where we started with, it says, speaking of, and if you want to know the, uh, the faith chapter, Hebrews 11, you should read it on your own. But I'm going to go with the verse 13 because it explains that how did these people in the Bible, how did they push through Odds that were so overwhelming, and most of them got through victorious with magnificent supernatural deliverances. But, verse 13 says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And they were persuaded of those promises, and they embraced them. See, in order to get through this life, they embraced a promise. How? That they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Do you ever feel like you're strange here? Hey, you become a Christian, you become strange to your friends. People look at you like, uh, you know, I don't know you anymore. We look strange. No, they're the ones who are strange. Because their mind has been corrupted about this is everything. How, how is this for a segue? Van Halen, okay, had a song. And in case you know, I'm a big Van Halen fan, David Lee Roth. Never liked the Sammy Hagar stuff, especially because Sammy Hagar wrote these words. Okay, best of both worlds. And if you ever listen to the song, he says, he actually says, you don't have to die and go to heaven or hang around to be born again. He says, stick around for what this world has to offer. We might, we will never be here again. And he goes, I want the best of both worlds, heaven here on earth. Well, look it up. That's exactly what he says. Where did he get that philosophy? Because it's the philosophy of almost everyone you know. Maybe you. And if it's your philosophy, you bought in to the lie. Verse 14 says, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out of Egypt, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country. And they're not really talking about a country. That is a heavenly one. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. You know what's sad today? It's a shame to call God your God here on planet Earth today. 
And they said, I don't want to live in a place where people are ashamed to call God their God. For he has prepared for them a city. And we, and we could, yeah, Israel and Jerusalem, we know that. But it's a picture, a type and a shadow. Now, people, don't misunderstand me because whenever you talk like this, people are, you know, I want you to understand the scripture in Hebrews 11 and what I'm saying. I'm not saying that the Christian, well, I should just die then. I just can't wait to die. I just should go and kill myself. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about that at all. To end your life is not what you want to do. You really want to get God angry? Do that. Because that is what the enemy wants. God wants you to live. Live the life that he has planned out for you to the very, very last breath. Because what God is talking about here is people, we can live and we can thrive in this crazy, stinking world if and when this living isn't everything but for that which is to come. So we must be careful. And another note here, be very careful. And this is going to sound confusing. Don't weep even for heaven, so to speak, even though that's what I, what I said. But Rich Mullins said it better. Weep for a man who, weep as a man who is longing for his home. If you want to go to heaven one day, yeah, if you ask most people, do you want to go to heaven? Yeah. Why? So they can escape all their problems here. So they can live blissfully and play golf on some cloud somewhere and do whatever they want to do. No. Do you know what's waiting for you in heaven? Why you should want to go there? Jesus Christ. That's the reason. Well, I don't want to go there to hang out with him. Well, then you might not even know him. No, we don't weep for heaven. We weep for who is there. And yes, those of your family members who died in faith, you'll get to see them too. Now, I know this is pretty heavy stuff. Yeah, I don't want to talk about dying, Pastor. Well, we're not. We're talking about living. We're talking about living. How are you going to live? Well, I'm going to explain to you this morning in a couple of minutes, first a couple of details I want to get out of the way, how you're going to thrive and really enjoy a joyless world. But first, a couple of warning things. First warning, Romans 12, 2. Be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So be careful. The world is trying to transform us to their thinking. And you're looking around and going, wow, these people are flipping out, man. I tell you, it's really easy now to not be transformed because you just look at whatever you see, it's obvious that it's insanity. And that's not what I want. But God says, be careful. But instead, he goes, have your mind transformed to a mind that has priorities that are proper. 1 Timothy 6, 7. Remember this. It's funny how much of these things are quoted by people and they don't realize they're from the Bible. 1 Timothy 6, 7. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Just a little reminder. Never saw a hearse with a trailer hitch on it, right? There's Bob. He died. He's got all of his stuff tied on the back. Okay? You see two graves, a rich man and a poor man. Six feet under, same graves, same dirt. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Also this, 1 Timothy 6.17, charge them... Now, this is, you're, as a believer, we need to remind people. It's our responsibility. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded and trust in uncertain riches. Is there anything that you're holding on to that is a certainty? No. Your money is not certain. Your health is not certain. Your future is not. Our nation is not certain. 
If you hold on to those, your joy is not certain. Your happiness is, what is certain? You better hold on to that cloud. Nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Who? Children of God. He gives us so much to enjoy, people. And we need to take inventory and look around and say, Gee, I'm so miserable, but boy, what do I have that others don't? You have a lot. And God says, you better be thankful for it. I'll move you somewhere. You want to go to Ukraine? You want to go to Russia? I'll send you there. 1 Corinthians 3.19. Oh, let's go to 3.18. Let no man deceive himself. Uh, how many people are deceiving themselves today? If any man among you seems to be wrought wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. Isn't that funny what Paul says? I'd rather be a fool for Christ. Isn't it funny the world thinks you're a fool? You're a fool for sitting here today. God says no. You're not foolish. You're not foolish at all. You need to become foolish to all these things of this world and become yeah and do become a fool for Christ that you may be wise for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God do you think God is impressed with scientists and politicians wow that guy's really impressive well I'm gonna f no I don't care how brilliant and how smart if that man or woman doesn't have God as their leader they're nothing and they're fools for it is written, he takes the wise in their own craftiness. I think we're beginning to see a little bit of that. I kind of get a little schmirk when I see nutty people get destroyed by their nutty philosophies. Not that I want anything bad to happen, but you say, hey, this is insanity. Insanity breeds insanity. God says, let them show themselves foolish, for they will become fools. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. The wisdom of this world, they're so self-centered. You think anybody really cares about you? Or their places, or their positions, or what's important to them? Verse 21, therefore let no man glory in men. That's a warning. Don't worship people at all. No, you shouldn't worship anything but God. But what does he say? For all things are yours. We're worshiping these people. He goes, I've already given you an inheritance. You have so much and you don't see it. You have me, the creator. It's all yours. Second Corinthians 4.4. 4. We said, but why does the world, why? Did you ever wonder, how come your friends don't get it? You're all excited about, yeah, it's like you, you, know, you buy something, you're all excited and you show it to somebody and you're like, oh, that's nice. You're not excited about this? Look how cool this is. Yeah, that's okay. Second Corinthians 4.4 4. Why is the world like that today? And I pray it's not you. In whom the God of this world, lowercase g, if you guys pay attention to Center Ridge Bible Church, God of this world, lowercase g, it's not talking about God the Creator. There is a God of this world, and He's not God the Creator. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. That's why your friends don't get it. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. They've been led down a road. We all have. But we're not blinded. I'm in that song, Amazing Grace, I once was blind, and now I see. I didn't get dumber when I came to Christ. I, came, I became smarter. It's like, wow, I never saw what was going on. I was right involved in it, and I didn't even see it. you got five minutes. We're going to put away the heavy theology. And I want to explain to you the key to happy living here. Through hardships and troubles and good times and bad, how do we do it? People, it's all about motivation and what drives you. I'm going to give you some examples to make a heavy point a simple point. 
Most of you go to work, you've been working a long time, and every year you start doing it again, right? And you're like, how do I do that? Get up in the morning, a lot of you have hard jobs. Some, I mean, no one likes going to work. Why do you do it? What's at the end? Well, you have some goals to keep you going. You're looking forward to a vacation. A lot of people, they're, well, man, a couple of weeks, I'm going away on vacation. That's my agenda. That's my goal. It gets me through those hard days. I keep on remembering, I'm going to be laying in the beach. It's going to be great. It's water skiing. I'm going to be, you know, Diet Pepsi commercial stuff. This is a Diet Pepsi commercial, if you didn't know it. You ever see those commercials, you know? Steal, I'm gonna steal another bit, you know? You look at the, you're watching a commercial, somebody's like drinking this drink. They're on beaches and frisbees and parties and like, I'm holding the same can, I ain't getting none of this. <laughs> I should have been a stand-up comic, I don't know. How do you make it through? Maybe what gets you through, as a young person, you get in a career, a job, you're working for that new car. And people, these are not bad things. Man, I'm saving up. I want that car so bad. I'm putting in the extra hours. That's good because it drives you. A new home, you're saving for that home. Maybe you're planning a wedding or that's what you're saving for, the reception. A lot of us getting older, retirement. Yeah, man, how do I push through today? I'm looking for that retirement day. Yeah, baby going to be great. Feet up. It's going to be awesome. And that might get you through. And I'm not saying that's wrong. Because they help push you through the year. People, the fact is, in case you don't know it, fall is coming. So is winter. It's the seasons of life. How you face them will determine if you make it through them. You could face the future with a frown on your face all the time. And I have to say, I think I have a frown more than a smile. We've got to stop that. We really got to. Sometimes we're our own worst enemies. I've got to remind everybody how bad everything is. Should be reminding people how good everything is in Christ. In the book, The Spiritual Man by Watchman Nee, I'm almost, I got a little bit more to go. I just read this the other day. If we live by feeling, we can't be living by faith. Meaning, if you base everything on how you feel, you're in for big trouble. If you base how good God is by how you feel, then means God is good if you feel good. Well, what's the reverse? If you feel bad, God is bad. Do not base success on how you feel. Base it on what is. What is the truth? So this year coming, tomorrow, you've got to yearn, people. You've got to burn. You've got to dream. You've got to push. You have to weep for anything you really, really want. And you should be weeping for heaven. And the good news about heaven, and you know this is the truth, unlike our cars and our boats and our vacations and our summer homes and all those things, you might never get them. You might. I don't want to... You, you could. I hope you all do. I hope... Yeah, I would love to have all the things that we're all you know, looking forward to, but they're not certain. And if you base your life on those things, what's going to happen? If they don't happen, you're going to be miserable. But what is for certain? God is for certain. Heaven is for certain. Jesus being there is for certain. You being a winner is for certain. Satan losing is for, is for certain. Everything that's going on in the world, God knows about. That's for certain. God has it predicted. He knows how it ends. He knows about the end of the age. He knows these things. It's a guarantee in Christ. And so if this daily news is killing you, and you're mad because you say, I just want to enjoy your life. I don't want to hear it anymore. I just, I don't, 
As we spoke, you know, it probably would be better if we lived someplace where there's no news. I saw this uh, lady on YouTube. It was a YouTube challenge thing. She, she tried. She, uh, she was just going to do it for a month. She ended up doing it for six months. Six months without a smartphone. Just a flip phone, just like Steve has, our head deacon. <laughs> I think he's a smart man. No smartness to your phones. I liked it when phones were dumb. I need to call you, you call me. That's about all I need it for. Okay? Has your, has, your, has your phone brought you much joy in life? Or does it, it brings me bad news every day. Oh, see, he's, he's the last holdout. Steve's, his flip phone broke, finally. He's like that guy, who's that guy from uh, MC, uh, NCIS? Gibbs. Gibbs has a flip phone, right? He's the last cool man around. We need all that smart stuff. <laughs> People, if the news is killing you and you're mad because, Bezza, I just want to enjoy my little life with my little home and my little family. Can I do that? God says you can. It's a choice, people, that we're making to not enjoy it. So the good news is focus on the big prize, not on all the clamor. I'm speaking to myself because it's really getting to me. And I'm going to give you a synopsis of how this all ends. Why, as a believer, you are a winner. It's like going into a football game knowing that you win, your team wins or at the racetrack. If I went on the racetrack knowing the end of this race, I get the checkered flag no matter what. You know what? It's a little bit easier to get through that race. Well, Jesus himself says these last words that we're going to speak this morning. And this is from God the Creator in human form. Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. First thing Jesus says is let not your heart be troubled. Okay. You, me, let not our hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. Okay. The, well, I, I believe in God. No, you've got to believe in me. Jesus makes it a point. How many people in the world? Oh, I believe in God. No. The demons believe in God and they tremble. Believing in God means nothing. In my Father's house are many mansions, Jesus says. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Oh, that's just wishful thinking. That's just like a poem. No! If that's just a poem and wishful thinking, people, let's just take this whole thing and just throw it away. Because Jesus is then a liar. He says, when I leave this earth, I went to prepare something for you. And for us to say, well, I don't want to go there. What an insult to Jesus. I really made it nice. Got nice pillows. It's, all, it's the best place. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am. You may be also. And we're... Where I go, you know the way. And one of the apostles, Thomas, the doubting apostle, what does he say? Thomas said unto him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. What the heck are you talking about? You look, you're standing right in front of us. Jesus was predicting he was going to leave, but come again. But if he left, he was going with a purpose. And Thomas says, but how can we know the way? I want this. Sounds pretty good. Jesus said to the, unto him, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. God the Father needs to be your focal point, to be more like Christ every day. As Father, each day, Lord, I think upon what you have waiting for me, the good plans you have for me, the promises that you have made for me. If you don't know what they are, listen to our study on Wednesday nights. We're up to week eight. I have tons of the promises that God has promised you. He cannot break them. Unconditional promises. And because if you know what the goal is, you can push through. Because we all live like, hey, it's probably all going to come crumbling down now. Not in Christ. Right? 
In this world, you're going to have tribulation. And I know I use that scripture a lot, but it really is applicable. But be of good cheer. God says, I have overcome this world. They're going to lose. No, but they're really... No, you're calling me a liar? I tell you, they're going... Their own devices, we just read, are going to come back and bite them. And they will look like babbling fools. Hmm. Hmm. We might be seeing the glory of God and don't even know it. Evil doesn't win. God wins. And you best be on the side of him. Because we win big. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, help us, Lord, to have the right goal that keeps us moving ahead, Lord. And it has to be you, Lord. And if I'm going to weep, enjoy about attaining something if i'm going to weep about losing something let me weep about not being with you sooner lord let me weep about a world that doesn't know you but needs to know you my family let me weep for my family who doesn't know you weep for my friends and people like my co-workers who don't know you we have so much to look forward to we really really do and yet the enemy has corrupted our minds that we assume it's over. It's all over. You Christians are done. Your God is finished. Evil will destroy. Nope, that's another lie. Father, let everyone here know you. And I pray if anyone here does not know you as Lord and Savior, they would bow the knee and say, Father in heaven, Lord, I don't understand all the theology, but I believe that you are the creator and you sent your son to die for my sins so I can be with you adopted into your family forever and ever so that I will be victorious my sins will not destroy me because you pay for them you died you rose again the third day and wherever you are that's where I'm going to be and I'm going to come back with you you said and we're going to fight the enemies it's going to be a glorious time and we're getting close to it and we should be excited and father help us in the meantime to enjoy it. it's a beautiful day Enjoy the flowers, enjoy the beach, enjoy it all. Because you have made this for us, Lord. To enjoy and to point people to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand, we'll close with the song.